but not really as the hero people made of him, as he was one of the founders of the Stel. And of course, the Stel is very important, not, both, not only in the Netherlands, but also international. But somehow, uh, Theo van Doesburg puts himself in the center of everything, as if he was the one who invented everything. And also the Stel has become this idea of the center, and it's by looking at his architecture, I will show you that his work is also part of the Dutch tradition. I emphasize the Dutch tradition because um, I'm very curious to know what kind of paint tradition you have in your country. Um, I will focus on Villa de Lange in Alkmaar, in the Netherlands, uh, the Obed in Strasbourg in France, and the studio house in Meudon, it's near Paris, also in France. But first of all, I would like to tell you something about how architects learned about color during the interwar period in the Netherlands. This is, these are drawings by uh, Hugo Leemann, professor from Delft, the technical school, uh, university, now it's called university, uh, it was in Delft. And imagine these drawings are black and white, and it's precisely written down what kind of color these architecture had. It's, um, I will look, um, what surprised me was that they knew a lot about the historical color used by them. But still you have to imagine it yourself. It's, it's, there's no color. Another thing um, which I found out, because I studied this for my PhD, first, what did they know about color? Well, they knew a lot about historical colors. And then, what were the color theories uh, in that time? Now, the most important color theories were those of Goethe and of Oswald during the interwar period. But one thing is that these theories were learned in, were written down in books for painters, for house painters. And every writer gives his own impression, his own idea on the color series. Fortunately, the color theory of Oswald was rather new, so this is um, quite like Oswald wrote it. But the color theory of Goethe, it was reinterpreted in the way they used it at that time. First of all, you don't have the right uh, symbol for it. And um, I, I will go to in, into that later. And then on the right hand, you see the, um, the color circle of Ostwald. Uh, it's a copy from the snail. It's an article from Bram van der Leek, one of the painters, he was a member, and he knows exactly how to use it. He says it's a very good system when you are at home and you want to explain to the house painter who is to make your color design somewhere else, to tell him exactly what kind of color he wants to, he needs to make. Um, but Oswald make harmonizes in, in his model. You can see several examples of that down there. And this, in a way, suggests that you have a, a, a new color harmony. But this is a color harmony which is thought by a chemist and not by an artist. And architects and artists who know to make their own harmony models, they can use it. But if you start with these harmony models, it's a chemist 
who tells you what your design should be like. And you must be aware of that. This is um, the color theory by Goethe, and I would like to go into that a bit further. Um, for Goethe, he says, yellow is the color which is light closest to light, and blue is the color which is dark closest to darkness, to dark. Those are the polarities. And when they meet like that, it, you have green, but if they intensify, you get tiger room, and they turn into purple. And somehow this is a very spiritual idea on color. It's the polarity of the earth. And the pur color purple is not a color which is on earth, but it's a spiritual color. Another thing is from Goethe that he says, these are the colors of light. But once you get the color of light in the material, the character of material is also um, important. You have the light, the color of light, and you have the material. Now, if you go to this explanation of the color theory of Goethe in the Interbellum, they only take the sinnlich sittliche um, explanation of his color theory. And that's the influence of color on people, because we as people are material as well. So the light, the, the idea of color influences us. One could say that way, one could say it in different ways as well. But this is not something they take over. And then you have the color theory of Ostwald, where the, the red and the green and the yellow and the blue are similar. There's, there's no hierarchy in the colors. There is no different meaning. Um, he has only 24 colors. And he says, um, when it's material, there's always white and black and a main color in it. So there's nothing about character of material anymore. So the whole idea of material is gone. It's just the color, and this color could be used for any material at all. But in fact, this is a copy of an original book by him, and he uses uh, special painted uh, papers to make this book because he can't print it. So even in his own theory, it turns out that you can't, it, it's not true that you, it has nothing to do with material. And I think all color theories have to cope with this problem. You have the color of light and you have the color of material. And, and these things are two different things. And how do you deal with it? You can make a model for it, you can make a concept for it, it's okay. But it's just a translation. Um, just be aware of that. And as Winfrey Bennett said uh, yesterday, uh, the NCS code could be seen as a familiar with the Ostwald. What I like about these two color theories is that like all the things of modern movement, it still influences us today. For sure, I can show you this by the chemical system of color. But my idea is that because of this Zindig Sittliche, our emotional thinking with color, which is taken over by the chemists from the paint industry, when they write about the color theory of the makes us very, very sensible for color. It has become a very individual case, whether you like color or not. And I don't think it has been that way for always. And I, I think being aware of that, that it, it, that it has a history, makes us more individual and more independent of our own taste. We have this in our profession. 
but also as a person, it's very good to know that we are influenced by this idea. Next, I would like to say something about one of the color theories of von Duisburg. He uh, publishes this color theory on the right um, in 1924. And he makes this division three yellow, five red, and eight blue. But he doesn't write down that also field and open yellow states. So. so it's not his idea. And what I said about Goethe by making the link black and blue, yellow and white, one could recognize that as well. It's okay, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the time, but it's not the beginning <laughs> as he wishes us to see it. Now, about the paint industry in the Netherlands, of course, the mills <laughs> here. Um, well, they're part of this paint industry. From the early 17th, 17th century, uh, we have these mills molding oil, molding pigments. And the paint industry is, is very important in the Netherlands. And especially in the, because of the wars, because Germany had a big um, a factory industry as well. But it was very um, positive for the Dutch, according to this, that the borders were closed. And the factories had to um, couldn't trade as much abroad as before. And they started to concentrate on the Netherlands for the paint industry. Um, I show you uh, how it started, just small um, working shops. And another thing which you can also see by uh, this drawing by Le Rigolin is that whenever uh, the industry got bigger and larger, there was a new building. And especially before the Second World War, it was the, uh, the molding which was developed. So the electricity made it possible to make a finer molding grading for pigments. And this was very positive because uh, then they could get a class paint. The Riponel factory is said that it, um, the, uh, the technical director of the factory was the one who invented Japanlak and Japanese lac. And it was a high class paint. And the good thing about it was you, you had a high class and color layer in one layer. And before that, it was not possible to make a high gloss paint layer. First you had the color, and then you had the orange above it. And we do say that the architects of the modern movement like to use this paint. Uh, the photos on the right hand are the factory of Riponin. It's already a bit industrial. On the left hand, it's another factory uh, in the north of the Netherlands. It's more um, like a workshop. But during the interbellum, there were painters who made their own paint. There were ready-made paints. There were paint past pastas. Um, now, this knowledge um, will I use with the projects by Theo van Duisburg, like the Huis de Lange, which has been restored recently. When you enter the house, um, you see this marble hallway. And it turned out that it has a stenciling above. That is from uh, Table Lusberg. And for me, it was very strange to see a marble hallway and the stenciled um, paint above. What uh, I forgot to tell you was that. Uh, Lehmann writes down, not only he gives this uh, nice uh, information about colors, but the way he writes about color, it's, um, he, for example, he writes about a green temple, a green interior. And then later on, it turns out that it is a marble interior. 
when I see this, I first think, oh, it's marble, and then I see it's a white and green marble. But I think that during the interbellum, it was not so much a division yet between the color and the material. The color could be any material, not just paint. And I noticed that also by the hallway in by Van Duisburg. This is um, a photo, and if you... The architectural paint research showed this color scheme, but then it's both painted and it's textile and it's wood and it's this uh, class design, colored class design by Podusper. Even though he says, I designed it as a piece of art which has nothing to do with the interior. For him it was two different things. You do see that all these things come together and it's much more different material than it will be later on. Another thing is um, two of the rooms. In the colors, Fair of Dusburg writes about his friend. And I hope you can see that indeed there is a difference if there is a green dadu or a purple dadu. That this has not. The green is much more relaxing than the purple, I think. About the reconstruction, fortunately this decoration could be saved, but the plasterwork couldn't. And it was partly painted, and it was um, partly reconstructed and partly um, restored with the same pigments, but then with a different binding. So that was a quite traditional start for Van Duisburg, working together with the architect Jan Mills. Now the next project is the project in the Obed, together with um, Sophie Teuber and Hans Arp. This is the, the, the plan from the first floor. Um, here. Um, this is the Salle de Cinéma, the Salle de Fête, the bar, the escalier or the stairs, and the voyer. The Cinéma was already restored when I was involved with this project, and it was restored in the altered colors. And the uh, Salle de Fête looked like that. And the technical the committee decided to <coughs> have a reconstruction to conserve the, this situation and to have a reconstruction in the fresh colors. <coughs> because they said it's like the idea of Van Duisburg was that you, the, you were living, you were staying in a piece of art. So now the, the art is not only a window, but it has become a three-dimensional space. This was what it looked like. These are the drawings. And in fact, Duisburg wanted to use throughout color material, but he was not allowed to. So he used Ripollin. Now this is the color chart of, of Ripollin, and I don't think he did it with the Ripollin because well, I will show you later by the um, <coughs> samples that it was too complicated to have it ready made. But what I think, what might be the case, is that Le Riponin was just a high gloss oil paint. Sometimes you have these company names which become a type of paint. And Probably 
the glass was not high enough because um, he used an extra varnish over the paint layers. Here we see uh, the samples where all the, um, again, also here from Duisburg uses a gray pink ground layer, then two white layers, and then three layers to get the right color of yellow. And he has a dark yellow and a light yellow. Um, by re reconstructing the paint layers, we notice that all these thin paint layers of oil influence each other. And the painter who tried to do it faster with a white ground layer and exactly the same yellow layers, well, it turned out that it doesn't work. So all these thin paint layers influence each other. Whereas the gray of the design was not gray at all. So you can't think of his color theory if you see it, because the gray was compound with all kind of uh, color pigments. And in fact, if you make a gray with color, a colored gray, it will integrate very good with the colors of the scheme. See? Sometimes we think we have to um, make a beautiful scale from, from, from colors and we don't know how to, um, how to make them look nice with each other. But if you use the same colors of the colored squares in the gray, it's easier to have a, a good color composition. And this is something which painters know. But it's completely different from what the theories tell you. <coughs> the stairs, and here you can see that the design of the stairs, also by Theo von Duisburg, he was really um, influenced by another architect he worked with, Aust. On the left side you see uh, a photo by Aust, work of Aust. Um, for the stairs we were sure to reconstruct, but for the foyer we were not sure, and we said we keep it, we, we, we leave it white. Of course, we, we had brown and blue stripes, but there were also silver circles above it. And we said, we just leave it like that, we don't want to do something we're not sure of. And I'm very happy that people found a solution by making an exhibition with these lines, so you can see that it's new, and still the original concept um, is, is right again. But another thing is that in these colors, you can see that it matches the color brown and blue with the idea of harmony by Ostkant. And you can have the same results from the, from the Salafet and the Cineva. And even by the bar by Sophie Torbach. So it's not just a three-dimensional painting, it's also an idea of that time. And the last thing I'd like to show you is the studio house by Van Duisburg in Meldon. First he wanted to make uh, color schemes all over, but in the end he only uses color for the doors. And I think now he has become more like an architect using the colors more functional or the color scheme goes together with the architecture and again one could see this as a harmony model by Ostwald. The interior door though is completely grey and the floors have a red and a natural brown color and tiles. And these floors
floors are also used in the Fresnel factory in Rotterdam. This type of floors in the same color.